The tyrants and wicked rulers of America love the popular interpretation of Romans 13, taught by churchmen across America and believed, unfortunately, by the vast majority of Christians. They love it. And what is the popular view of Romans 13 as interpreted by the vast majority of churchmen and believed by most Christians? It is the view that we are to always obey the civil government. It's not working. Oh, it is working. Okay. Strike that. <laughs> the reason it is loved by the tyrants and the wicked rulers is because of the fact that it aids and abets them in their tyranny and in their evil. The churchman of Magdeburg called this assertion that we are to always obey the civil government. They call that an invention of the devil. Today I want to give you three convincing proofs that Romans 13 does not teach unlimited obedience to the civil government. And those three things are, number one, nowhere does Romans 13 state that we are to give unlimited obedience to the civil government. Rather, men impose such thoughts upon the text. Number two, proper hermeneutics forbid such a conclusion that we are in obedience to the civil government. And number three, Romans 13 contains limitation clauses that make it clear the civil government's authority is not unlimited, nor therefore is our obedience to the civil government to be unlimited. So let's go with number one. Nowhere does Romans 13 state that we are to give unlimited obedience to the civil government rather than impose such thoughts upon the text. If you just open your Bibles and look at the text, you will realize what I'm saying is true. It isn't there. There is nowhere in Romans 13 is it asserted that we are always to obey the civil authorities. It's imposed on the text. It's what we call eisegesis. Eis is the Greek word for into. It's where you read into the passage something that is not there. We don't want to do eisegesis, we want to do exegesis. And when we just look at the plain reading of the text, we see that nowhere in Romans 13 does it assert that we are to always obey the civil authorities. In fact, there isn't one verse in the entire Bible that asserts that we're always to obey the civil authorities. We want to make sure that we do proper hermeneutics. And proper her hermeneutics The hallmark of it is scripture interprets scripture. We're not to look at a passage in a vacuum. We are to look at the passage in light of the whole of God's word. Scripture interprets scripture. Scripture with a big S interprets scripture with a small s. In other words, when you're looking at a particular passage or verse, scripture with a small s, you have to look at it in the view of the light of the whole of God's word, scripture with a big S. Scripture interprets scripture. And when you do that, you realize that the assertion that we're always to obey the civil authorities does not hold up to proper hermeneutics because there are many passages in scripture which make it abundantly clear that the people of God disobeyed the civil authorities and God actually commended them for that. One example would be the Hebrew midwives. Remember the Hebrew midwives? They were told by Pharaoh to kill the male Hebrew children. But instead of obeying the civil authorities, the scripture reads in Exodus 1.17, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. Amen. And what did God do? God therefore dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. If the assertion that we are always to obey the civil authorities is true, this passage stands in complete contradiction to it. And what about the situation with Daniel? Remember it says in Daniel chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. In chapter 6, some wicked men wanted to catch Daniel in a trap. They wanted the king to declare a law that no one could pray to any deity but only to him. Notice that this law was made in clear contradiction to the word of God. This was a classic showdown where the law of man 
contravened the law and word of God. And notice that this law was just 30 days. Just a mask, you know, just 30 days. And notice how Daniel responded. Notice he didn't offer blithe compliance and obedience. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Notice Daniel didn't respond by saying, well, that's an unjust and immoral law, but the state is ruled, so I must obey. Notice that he didn't say, well, it's only for 30 days, so that's okay. No, notice he continued to do what he's always done. He knelt down so no one could mistake what he was doing. He did it by the window so people could see, and he did it three times. And that brought him into conflict with the state. These two situations, the situation with the Hebrew midwives and the situation with Daniel, are examples of the historic Christian standard and that is when the state commands that which God forbids, like murdering someone with the Hebrew midwives, or forbids that which God commands, like not praying to the Lord, as Daniel was commanded, we are to obey God rather than man. We are to obey God rather than the state. Massively important. That's the standard that God has established for us. And there's many other examples in scripture. We have the parents of Moses in Hebrews 11:23. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Understand, this is in the hall of fame of faith. Something American Christians love to, oh, it's in the hall of fame of faith. Yeah, his parents defied the civil authorities and hid Moses for three months. And notice they weren't filled with cowering fear. As scripture says, they were not afraid of the king's command. And God honors their act of faithfulness to him by placing this narrative in the Hall of Fame of Faith. And what about the author of Romans 13, the guy who actually wrote it, penned it, the Apostle Paul? In 2 Corinthians 11, 32 through 33, Paul's reminiscing about a situation he found himself in. And he says, in Damascus, the governor under Artus, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desiring to arrest me but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. So here we don't see Paul blithely submitting to the civil authorities. Rather, we see him, even though he knows they want to arrest him, craftily fleeing in a basket down the side of the wall to avoid submit being arrested by the civil authorities. And then, of course, there's the famous one where the apostles were told not to preach, Acts 5.29, and Peter and the apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. If this assertion that we are always to obey the civil authorities is true, all these passages and many more stand in complete contradiction to that assertion. The third convincing proof is that Romans 13 contains limitation clauses that make it clear the civil government's authority is not unlimited, nor therefore is our obedience to the civil government to be unlimited. Just look at it. Romans 13, verses 3 and 4, those are limitation clauses. Rulers are a terror to good works. Um, not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be afraid, unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. These are limitation clauses regarding the authority that the civil magistrate possesses. Now, I always find it interesting that when you look at the three great governments that God has established, family government, church government, and civil government, when you look at scripture regarding the other two great governments, family and church, it talks about obeying those in authority, but there are no limitation clauses. Yet no one would take those to mean that parents and elders have unlimited authority. Yet when it comes to the civil realm, the third great government, civil government, where there are limitation clauses on their authority, people automatically think that they're always to obey. That's because the churchmen have taught them wrong, 
and because they live in a statist hell where all of society has taught them that the state is the be all and end all and they should always obey. Let me demonstrate this for you. Notice in Colossians 3.20, regarding family government, children obey your parents in all things for this is well pleasing to the Lord. No limitation clauses, yet no one would take that to mean that if a father told his 12 year old boy to go down to the corner and rob the gas station because if he gets caught, he'll get a slap on the wrist. But if dad doesn't get caught, he's going to prison for years. No one would fault the 12 year old boy for not obeying his father. And when it comes to church government, the scriptures say, obey those who rule over you. Talking about the elders and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be profitable. That would be unprofitable for you. No limitation clauses. Yet no one would fault a congregant who caught the pastor taking money out of the till and the pastor told him, don't tell the elders about that. No one would fault the congregant for telling the elders about what the pastor did. So again, no limitation clauses, but no one views their authority as being unlimited. But for some reason, when it comes to the civil authority, where there are limitation clauses, then suddenly everybody believes that they're always to obey. Even to the point where men say things like, if the governor tells me to put pinwheels on my head to go into the grocery store, I put pinwheels on my head to go into the grocery store. A complete absurdity and in total opposition to historic Christianity. Now there's three other things I wanna quickly address. One is the view of we are to obey in all things unless they say we cannot preach the gospel. Ever heard that? Very common. How do we know that's not true? Because when you look at the word of God, there's so many places where the people of God disobey the civil authorities over a matter that has nothing to do with preaching the gospel, okay? So yeah, we don't obey if they tell us not to preach the gospel, but that isn't the only area we don't obey in. The second one I wanna address is we are to obey unless we have to personally sin. Ever heard that one? Well, that's not true either. Paul didn't have to personally sin when he fled from the governor down the side of a wall in a basket. And let's bring it up to more current times of our history here in, Amer here in America. What about the abolitionists back in the 1850s? No one told them they had to own a slave. No one told them they had to beat a slave. They didn't have to personally sin, but yet they disobeyed the civil authorities and abridged the Federal Fugitive Slave Act and helped slaves escape up to Canada. And what about Cory Ten Boom in Germany? No one told her she had to work at a death camp. No one told her she had to deliver Jews to the death camp. No one told her she had to personally sin. And yet she defied and disobeyed the civil authorities and hid Jews in her home. And what about here in America, just 20, 30 years ago? where over 90,000 Christians were arrested for interposing at the doors of the abortion clinic. No one told them they had to abort their own son or daughter. No one told them they had to kill someone's son or daughter. They didn't have to personally sin, but yet they interposed at the door of the abortion clinic, violating the laws of man in order to protect those image bearers from being murdered. So this is a complete messed up idea too. We are to obey unless we have to personally sin. Again, the standard is, if the state commands that which God forbids or forbids that which God commands, we're to obey God rather than man. The third thing I wanna address is prescriptive versus descriptive. Many people say, well, Paul was writing and um, while Nero was emperor, and he's as wicked as they come, so we should obey everything our government says here. Well, the problem with that is, is Paul wasn't writing descriptively, he was writing prescriptively. When you're writing descriptively, you're describing what's going on. When you're writing prescriptively, you're talking about how things ought to be. If Paul was writing descriptively, Nero would be mentioned. If Paul was writing descriptively, the Roman government would be mentioned. Neither of them are mentioned, why? Because Paul was not writing descriptively, he was writing prescriptively about how things should be. So this idea that Nero was in charge then and he's telling them all to obey Nero is false. And what about the limits of the state? They're twofold. They're not to impose any law, policy, or court opinion which impugns the law or word of God. And number two, the magistrates are not to exceed the limits 
of their authority. And when it comes to the doctrine of the lesser magistrates as God's ministers, the magistrates to apply this standard to their office in civil government. When the superior authority does wrong, the lesser authority is not to give blithe obedience and join in the rebellion of the superior civil authority. Rather, their duty is to obey God and interpose against the evil of the superior civil authority. As Daniel said to Darius in Daniel 6.22, O king, I have committed no crime against you. In other words, an unjust law or immoral law is no law at all. And as Christian men and women, may we stand true to Christ, to his law, and to his word. God bless you.